This week on the extended panel, Kerry legend Mickey Ned O'Sullivan talks through his journey from his playing days to management, including his time with the South African rugby squad prior to the 2007 World Cup. Coming right up on the extended panel. Pass as he sent to the party Lynch. And here comes Kerry again. Mickey Sullivan going racing through. Gallon Larkin's in front of him. He's got past Alan Larkin. Paddy Riley's after him. Georgie Wilson's after him. Everybody's after him. And he started working, working. He got back on the team. He encouraged every young player around him. He kept improving all the time till his very last game. He always pushed himself to the very limit. And he be to me that Michael Jordan of Gaelic football, you know? A very good evening and welcome to all the viewers and listeners to another brand new episode of the Extended Panel Sports Show brought to you in association with Lear Media with me, your host, Taigo Shukru. Joining us on this evening's episode, we have Kerry legend Mickey Ned O'Sullivan, who will be talking all things football, sport and coaching. Good evening, Mickey. Good evening, Taig. Great, uh, great to be here. Yes, great to have you on the show. And uh, also joining me this afternoon, I have trusted friend and colleague of the Extended Panel, Jimmy Maher. Jimmy, how are you keeping? Hi Shucks, uh, how are things? Uh, delighted to have the opportunity to speak with Mickey today and, and it's a massive honour for us to have him on the show. He, he brings a wealth of experience and it's a fantastic opportunity for us to get an insight into his career as a, as a player and, and in management as well, you know. Mm. Well Mickey, it's, it's great to have you. How, how, how are you keeping anyway? How have you found the unprecedented times and stuff? You've kept yourself sane? Well, I suppose the fact that I, I, am, I had been retired, I, I, I had plenty of practice. <laughs> so. It was no, it was no big deal, and enjoy it, and uh, plenty kept busy, and we're very fortunate the weather has been so good. If if it started in October and went into November, December, January, people would have really felt the pressure. But apart from that, it was excellent. Yeah, hundred percent. And Mickey, we saw you on uh, RT News the other evening talking about. The roadmap for a return of the GA and the positive effect that that'll have on people in your own area. How much of a boost will will it give? You know, to have local areas for to have that outline now for a return to GA. Well, I suppose as I said that um, I suppose the GA is, is part and parcel of the social fabric of every rural community, mm-hmm. and it was you know the lockdown uh, deprived people of their expression, but now opening it up. With a, with, a, with a plan, it provides people with a bit of, especially that for parents of young children that will be getting involved, they know now that there is, there is a procedure in place and there, there, there will be safe distancing and they'll be well looked after. And they arrive, they get out of their car, tugged out, involved, home, parents there again to collect them. And they'll have the confidence that everything will be well done and they're not putting their children in any danger. Mm. And hearing you speak, Mickey, there of your, your local area, um, it's, it's obvious you have great pride of Ken Mayer, where you're from, uh, where you were brought up. And um, I suppose we'd say, could you give us an insight into the, your, your background within the GA growing up in Ken Mayer? Well, I suppose like in all rural communities, GA was very central. But the club was very much a, a hurling club in the in the sixties, and um, I suppose in the towards the middle to the late sixties, there was a guard restationed to Kilmere called P.J. McIntyre, and he started football really. Even though football had been there all along, but he, he organised it. He structured underage and got us all interested. And from there it grew. And um, it was a dual club, hurling and football. So we played both. Mm. And uh, obviously being in Kerry, uh, ambition was to play for Kerry in football always, uh, the ambition of most young lads. So I was no different. 
said, Jimmy, Jimmy there is delighted anyway to hear you talking about hurling anyway, because that's, that's his strong point and being a Kilkenny man. But, uh, from, you're from Khmer yourself, Mickey, but you, you didn't go to school there. You, you ended up teaching in Ballyborny, but you played there as well. I'm sure you had some, some great memories playing Carnivory in football in, in school, in second level. Yes, yes. We, uh, I went to boarding school in Colossi Isakon in Ballyborny. And again, football there was a, was a re- second religion. And uh, we were very fortunate that we had uh, brothers, De La Salle brothers, that took a great interest in coaching of football. And then you had the great ingredients who have a mixture of Cork and Kerry and of, from the, of students. Great banter, great opposition. And, and it was about 60 40, I'd say, percentage wise. So, we were in the heart of football from the word go. Mm. And I suppose in my five years there, we competed in four Cornivory finals. I played in the four of them. There was two replays. But we lost every <laughs> final. And three, three and St. Brendan's beat us on three occasions. And both occasions, they went on and won the, Corn- the Hogan Cup. But it was disappointing from that point of view. And to add injury, insult to injury, the year I left, they won the carnivore. <laughs> um, I, was a, I wasn't a good omen. Yeah. <clears throat> but it, it, it was, a, it, it was a, a great nursery for Gaelic football. Mm. And nothing else mattered but Gaelic football there. So yeah. it was a great um, training ground to have. And you, you get that opportunity, Mickey, in school to, to play with some good teams. And when you go back to the club, you you know, if you're lucky enough in your time to win something with your club, you know, you get to play with some great players and you get an opportunity then, if you are lucky, to, to win something. You won three intermediate titles and a Ken Mayor District County Championship. Great memories along the way and, you know, some great football and names involved in those teams with you. Yes, uh, I was very fortunate that... It, it, it's all about being in the right place at the right time. When the club was growing and we won it three in uh, Towns Cup and three intermediate championships. And then probably the pinnacle then was the, was the, the county senior championship in uh, 1974, which was a combination of four clubs, Kilmere, Temple, No, to assist in Kilgarvan. And probably that was probably one of my most enjoyable experiences because you were playing with people you grew up with and you were achieving something that was never achieved before and it was it was it was great it really put Khmer on the map on a football point of view and of course you were playing with the likes of Pat Spillane was just coming and Mick Spillane they were all very young at the time but it it and then you had lads that were shoving on a bit uh, as well. So it was a combination of, of youth and experience. Mm. But it was, again, the community involvement. Everybody bought into it. Everybody in the locality was part and part and parcel of the, of the whole thing. So it was, it was probably my most um, enjoyable experience in Gaelic football. Mm. as a player and just mm. then going going from the amazing success you had at club level there and at district level and, and and the fan memory you might just talk us through mickey that transition then into the green and yellow jersey you know being called first i suppose into the Kerry minors and then you were involved i think with the seniors and the 21s in the same year i suppose it's always something as you mentioned earlier that you're dreaming about growing up is, is playing for Kerry. yes um we were again it is interesting we played in the mi- we, we, we got to the mi- All Ireland Minor in 1970, Kerry. I, I was playing in the Kerry Minor team. And we drew the first game and we were beaten in the replay by Galway in the second, in the replay two, two weeks later. But the interesting point was nine of our t- minor team that lost one senior all Ireland's five years later, yet only one or two of the Galway players ever played senior afterwards. 
it's an interesting um, observation about miners. Maybe miners are better off not winning mm. because the hunger that is satisfied with a lot of players, then they're all, they've won an All Ireland medal and that's it. And they're big fish in a small pond. But the hunger stays there mm. if, you're, if you don't win. And uh, it's interesting that nine of those players started in an All Ireland, won an All Ireland five years later. At the average age would have been about 22. Mm. So, so I was lucky then after the minor that year, I was brought into the senior panel by Jackie Lyon who was then the manager of the Kerry team. So uh, what the time was, we, I was playing with um, players that had were finishing their career, the Mick O'Connells, Mick O'Dwyers, uh, Pat Griffins, all those guys of the 60s. And then there was a new branch beginning, gradually being introduced in the early 70s that would go on and be very successful again with Kerry. But it was a transition period with Kerry then for the next four years. We didn't win a championship, but we won four national leagues, which was interesting. And from 71 to 74. And the other thing was people said, you know, that the Kerry team of 1975 came from nowhere. They had Those players had a lot of experience. They didn't just come from nowhere. They had played in maybe four National League finals and won them, mm. some of them. And uh, so even though they hadn't been championship, winning any championship, they had a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. And in, in that time, Mickey, in the, in the early 70s, were you, all, you were also, I'm correct in saying you were also studying PE at the same time as trying to balance playing with Kerry as well? Yes. Um, I got a scholarship uh, in 1970 to study physical education in England. At the time, there was no uh, Limerick University. So they, it, it, it was, um, it, there was no, so the Department of Education gave out about eight scholarships and I was fortunate to get one of them to go to Strawberry Hill, which, which was part of University of London. And it was an, an amazing opportunity because sports science and physical education didn't exist in Ireland at the time. And you were being exposed to modern ways of doing things at a time when it wasn't being done in Ireland. And you were studying with Olympic champions and um, exposed to all the the modern theories and developments in sport. So it was a great time, as well as the whole educational opportunity of uh, interacting with people from different cultures. It was a big cultural shock to go from an Irish speaking boarding school in the belt of the West Cork to the middle of London mm -hmm. in part of the University of London. And what was a, it was so stimulating and enjoyable and enjoyable mm. and then we would have to come back every so often to play matches it was difficult because you had you had no training you trained on your own and you probably i played rugby but there was it was a different game and you had to come back in the weekends then and play a match without any uh proper training but um it was it was exciting to have that different perspective but but interesting and and mickey in that time would any of the kerry management teams have tapped into the knowledge you were gaining over in in, in london um uh in i suppose the players themselves were very interested the mick o'connells the mick o'dwyers would, would scrutinize me every night at training when I'd be home about new new ways of doing things. Um, I, I often tell a story about the first training session I was at was um, Jackie Lyon and was training us and uh, 
Michael Connell says to me after the match training, he says, what do you think of the training? I said, it was good, very good. I said, but we no warm up, no warm down. And I said, well, well, the, the, then the boys, you know, I was a bit naive and the old experienced lads would start drawing me out, you see. And he says, what do you want to warm up or warm down for? And I was went into the theory of explaining the lactic acid and the physiology of the whole thing. So anyway, the next night I, I, I was in training, I was christened lactic acid. <laughs> 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 but um, it, 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 it began to seep. But I remember in, I was captain of the under 21s in 1973. And Johnny Welsh, who was a former Kerry footballer uh, of the 30s and 40s, was managing the team. So he used to ask me to take the training sessions because I suppose that time football was different, management was different. It was all about, there was no coaching, really. It was physical activity. It was physical training. So I used to take the training. And we actually won the All-Ireland that year. And, but the difference that time, probably I'm preempting what you're going to talk about, but it, management that time was, the manager was chief cook and bottle washer. He did everything. He put out the, the flags and the cones and he washed the jerseys and he did everything. And it was a one man show basically, even though he had selectors, it was a one man show. And it was only physical activity, physical training. There was very little coaching. Now the whole thing, the concept has changed enormously. But that time, just to answer your question, I was asked, I used to be asked to take training sessions because they perceived that I knew something about it. Mm. Very good, very good. I suppose, Mickey, uh, just going there, you're speaking about your own kind of being asked to take training sessions and stuff. I suppose management was clearly having done PE was always kind of in the in the pipeline. You know, talk us through maybe getting into management. Was that a gradual process? Was that always in your plans or, or how did that come about? Well, I suppose it just happened because you before you even finish college, you ended up managing your club team, you manage my in, in, and in that situation, I was maybe 21. I was managing the under 21. I wasn't managing the under 21, but I, I was helping to train them. And it was expected of you that you knew what it was all about. Well, you had a great knowledge of physical training, but management is totally, isn't just, that's only one aspect of, of management. But you were pushed into these positions which I enjoyed. And I had no great ambitions to train uh, teams at the time. Only, you know, I was 21, 22, and he wanted to play football. But um, it is interesting that in 1975, then in the beginning of the year, we didn't have a trainer, a manager in the Kerry team. And the county board, Andy Molno, approached me, he was the county secretary, to know would I go to do a coaching course in Gormanston at the time, which was being run by um, Joe Lennon. And Joe Lennon was, uh, was the, the guru on coaching and team preparation at the time. And so I says, I would. And it was April. And he says, there are two places. So I says, I know who I bring with me. And I rang Mick on the wire. And I said, Mick, would you go to a coaching course in Gormanstown with me? I'm going up over Easter. And he says, what's involved? Who's given it? And he says, no. I said, Joe Lennon, no. He says, but Joe hadn't been too complimentary about the style of Kerry football at the time. So eventually coaxed Mick to travel. And Kevin Heffernan, who was manager of Dublin at the time, was giving some part of the course and he gave an, an exhibition training session with the Dublin team who were the present All-Ireland champions that time and we were I was very impressed by them and on our way home I said to Mick 
will you train us? And he says, no way. He says, I wouldn't have time. But by the time we got to Kinmare, Mick was driving. He says, uh, I, I got the feeling that he might train us. So when I got in the door anyway, I rang um, the county chairman, John McKinn. I says, Mick will train us, but you'll have to go back in the morning just to push him over the line. <laughs> and, and that's what happened. And Mick put the training and he rang me then two days later and he says, we're going to have training Tuesday night, but we'll make up the training session for me. And I says, grand, we went through, arrived early, we made out the training session. After the training session, he turns to me and he says, how was it? I says, it was good, I said, but not half, hard enough. So next night, he doubled it up. Never asked me again, ever again, <laughs> about, uh, about a training session. And th that training session was central for the next 11 years. <laughs> so that's... Uh, how I didn't get into management, but you asked me about the, the about getting into management. I suppose the fact that I was a teacher and that I was coaching the school team, it was a natural progression. I enjoyed it, mm. and uh, over the years, then you would be involved with the club. You would be involved. I was involved with the county under twenty ones, and I, I help out whatever. Until, um, until oh yes, I became um, when I retired. Then Mick Dwyer asked me to get involved in the management with him, and I was a selector with him on the management team for eighty four, eighty five, eighty six, and eighty seven. And Kerry won three All Islands during that period. So again, you learn a lot in management from Mick. Mick was. Um, he had great management skills, or he was a great man manager. He understood lads, mm. and he understood the how to turn them on and what turned them on. Each yeah. player, and he knew the difference of lads, and he knew how to hop balls with players. And he was a good man manager, and I learned a lot from him. And, 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 and in that time with uh, with Miko and you spoke about Kevin Heffernan there too, um, Mickey, we'd say, was it was it Miko's man management and uh, we'd say, was that his strongest point forte, let's say, or was it anything else in particular? Like um, I think, to, yes, yes, Jimmy, I think it was his man management skills were exceptional. He had a great empathy and insight into what made people individuals tick. And he was able to press the right buttons at the right time. I think that was combined with having probably the most talented group of players you could get in, in the country at the time. So it was a combination of both, but it was his man. And also he led by example, he was very disciplined in himself. And um, and focused. And if players began to lose the run of themselves and get ideas, they weren't long brought down. He, he was able to bring them back down to reality again, you know, mm. which was difficult task when you had a lot of young players uh, suddenly be going, becoming heroes and to keep their feet on the ground and to keep them focused on the present rather than the past or the future. So he was a good, he was able to keep his finger on the pulse all the time. And that was his strength. More from Mickey Ned coming up in part two. Stay with us. We'd say you obviously then went into management yourself in 89. Um, Mickey, you, you take over the Kerry team and you uh, you end up then, I suppose, in 2005, we, we make a jump then that you, you take over the Limerick senior team. You know, um, in your own time in management, uh, what, have you, what have you learned yourself that if you were to give a manager going into inter-county set up a bit of advice, what, what have you learned yourself that's really, really important for you <clears> to that? What I would think is, number one, it's your management team. 
you get the best person that is in charge of, of that you will empower them then to do the physical preparation you get a, a very good coach you get a coach that understands coaching and if you're not good on the mental side you would bring in somebody who was i i always preferred to do it myself because i had a great interest in sports psychology going back i studied it in the 70s and i kept abreast of it all the time but i think that aspect of it is very important but it, management is not about the manager it's about empowering getting the best possible management team in place and then standing back and not micromanaging but getting the best out of each member of the management team and ego must not come into it and you must know when to stand back and let the people who are know their stuff oh in limerick i was very 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 fortunate i had a donny buckley as coach and i stood back because i knew donny knew much more than i did i keen on neil in charge of physical preparation i knew keen knew far more than i did so i stood back i'd michael mcgeehan who is now the coach with tipperary not a coach equally as good and i'd say the, the county board in limerick were saying we could get rid of this mickey ned because he does nothing <laughs> and and but ultimately and it's difficult at times to stand back and and just leave, leave the people who you empower the people who are experts in their field and your job as a manager is creating the environment where where players can grow and nurture and develop and provide the best possible facilities uh, and personnel for that to take place mm. that's the advice i would give anyone going into management is basically it's it's not about you it's about what you can provide for players to allow them grow and develop to their max so yeah, uh, just i was going to bring it back just b before let's say you took over limerick in 2005 uh you took charge of the underdogs in its debut season in 2004 uh, and beating the reigning all ireland champions your own Kerry. you might just take us back to your talking there about you know getting the best out of your management team and getting the best out of players the preparation that went into that journey to lead to a success like that one that night in Chile. well uh, well again uh we're fortunate that we had uh in the management team, you had Brian Mullins and you had Jarlett Burns and Michal Murkitik, people that that really understood football. But that time it was difficult because you had to have players that had never played at any level with with their county, minor under twenty one or senior, which was almost impossible, you know, to get players to that level in such a short space of time. Now. Last year I was involved in it again, and I saw the vast difference now that exists. But that time it was maybe 15 years ago. The difference between an, an inter-county player and a club player was reasonable, but the difference between a club player and an inter-county player now is vast, because they have they are in development squads from a very early age and the game has evolved to a very high standard so getting underdogs now to that level in two or three months is almost impossible whereas that time in 2004 we were fortunate that we got players to a peak when the inter-county players were at their their lowest point was maybe November, December, November, mm -hmm. because the league wasn't taken that seriously at that time. 
So we had an advantage. We were lucky. We got, um, we, we spotted Kieran Donaghy playing at underage level and liked him and approached him, would he be interested? Pierce, um, Connor Coonahan approached me and he says, we there's a good guy in our club in Cork, uh, Pierce O'Neill. He'd be good at the underdogs. He has potential. Bring him in. We did. They both played midfield for the underdogs and they beat Kerry, which was a, an amazing achievement for a group of lads that had only been together maybe for eight or nine weeks. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah. That's a, that's a special achievement for all of you, really, to take a, a group of players in that amount of time, and special for you as a management team to kind of change their lives in a way. We know what Kieran Donaghy and Pierce Mayle went on to do, and and indeed the other players to give them a kind of a, a magic moment like that from nowhere in a way was a special, I'd imagine. Yes, it was. Uh, but what it did was it showed that that time players could set their sights if they were good in club players to become inter-county players in a short period, well, a reasonable short period of time. Mm. And it shows to double, but it, the, the, the gap is so wide now if you're not part of a development squad, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you're, you're just kind of speaking a lot there about, we'll say, the development squads and stuff. How important really is it just to get young players in at that early age and really give them the chance to develop? Well, I think it's important. I know that five or six years ago, six years ago, maybe seven years ago, we set up a a program in Kerry of development squads, and it has been it had been subsequently proved to be very successful. But you know, it 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 shows now how prof- how focused and professional the, the the Gaelic games has become, and I think. I know that they're worried that it's too focused too early at 15 years of age and and it deprives the club of their the, those players involvement as well mm-hmm. so I think it's about getting the balance mm-hmm. between club and county and without getting too serious too early they have young players have got to enjoy their life as well they can't become professional players at 15 and 16 and 17. It it puts too much pressure on them too early. Yeah. And only a small percentage will eventually make the senior team in the end. Yeah. And M- Mickey, you speak there about the development squad you were, you, were, you were involved in. Can I just touch on the programme that you were involved in uh, bringing to the Kerry County Board and to kind of implement within the squad structure within Kerry. Was that a programme for coaches to follow? And was is there a template for coaches to follow? There, 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 yes, there, there is a template. And there is a structure. And I was fortunate that I had was on the coaching council of Ireland at the time. And Michael McGeehan, who was CEO of Coaching Ireland, had set up a template for sport in general and the development on a national level various sports and i i I got a lot of information from that and put a structure together that would be could be implemented gave that there was a a group set up which included eamon fitzmorris bomber list and john o'keefe pat o'shea and all the lads that were involved at and we teased it out and came up with this structure and then the games development took it over and implemented it at the time i also sent a template to the limerick county board for the football but I feel that it was implemented in hurling rather than football. <laughs> and Mike Reardon can take note. <laughs> and and just say, Mickey, um, in terms of uh, that template you put together, <clears throat> was that trying to develop the holistic player and um, all aspects? It, it probably is a bit narrow. Okay. It didn't have developed the holistic 
which I feel now Croke Park are trying to do and I agree with. I think it, it probably is too narrow a focus and doesn't develop. It, it looked at different aspects, all aspects of the development. But I still think that players should experience all sports for as long as possible to build up this um, physical vocabulary of, uh, uh, we'll say, of skill that they can then apply when they specialize it maybe later in, in, in their development. But I think what we did, we specialized too early without taking the overall holistic approach. Don't go anywhere. Coming up in part three, Mickey Ned talks about his time with the South African rugby squad and takes on our infamous rapid fire question round. Stay with us. The connecting, we'll say, like the different skills from different, you know, different even sports and stuff like that, Mickey. Is that something you, you took from your time in working in South Africa? Uh, I know, I think, was it the, you were, I, re I read an article about, we'll say, the um, kind of taking of skills from the different sports and transferring them together, and that was something that the Springbok coach was very into at the time? That, that is interesting because um, uh, I think it was 2005, uh, I got a call from Brendan Venter, who was one of the head coaches in South Africa at the time to know, would I be interested in, well, the contact was made through Conor O'Shea, whose dad would have been a good friend of mine, Jerome, and to know if they, they had a theory that the transfer of, of, of skills from one game to another would be very important. And they had identified aerial skills and kicking skills needed to be improved in the, in the, in the um, spring box, we'll say, number of skills that they were deficient in. Yeah. And they identified Jonathan Callard, who was then the manager of Bath Rugby Club, who was the English kicking coach. And they asked myself to go out and to, to, to know would I be interested in going out and working on the aerial skills with the five Super 14 teams and the Springboks themselves. The Super 14 teams would have been the, 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 blue, the Sharks, the Blue Bulls, the Cheetahs, uh, is it Pumas? There, there, there was five of them anyway in different Durban, Johannesburg. So I, I thought this was a great opportunity to, from, from a coaching point of view to, to see, to learn. And so both Janet and myself went out. We worked maybe a couple of days with all of the Super 14 teams. And I remember meeting um, um, Jay Quiet. He was manager. He was the coach, head coach of the Springboks at the time. And he said, you know, it could be the difference between winning and losing a World Cup final, he said. So when I arrived out, my I first thing I brought a video of the All Ireland of 2005, Kerry and Tyrone, and I had zoomed in on Daryl Shea and some of the Tyrone guys, uh, and I said I'd showed when I was showing the Springboks, I showed them ten minutes of it. I said beforehand where I was coming from because they they knew nothing about Gaelic football, and it was interesting. Part of the the coaching team was David Campisi, who had played uh, rugby with Australia. He had scored a winning try in, in Lansdowne Road 1991 against Ireland. But he was familiar with aerial skills from Aussie rules. But, and I brought him on board as well. But after 10 minutes, I stopped the video of the All-Ireland. And Jay White says, we want to see it all. <laughs> they were fascinated. Number one, that 80,000 people would be watching and the 
heirs weren't being paid. Mm. But what fascinated him more was the intensity and the speed of the game. And then he says, we can learn a lot from that game. He says, the way they could exploit space. He says, we're not exploiting space like he can do it. And uh, he said, and it has become to go more and more important. Now, a point he made to me was, I, I couldn't get over how big the forwards were, the, the Springboks forwards. I hadn't seen men as big and as, as forceful. Yeah. And yet they had very little aerial skills. It was just pure mass strength. Mm -hmm. So he said, could you imagine if we develop skill in these guys? But I says, I asked him a question. How, do, how come they were so big, the players, the, the forwards? And he says, about 200 years ago, when the Europeans came out to South Africa, they went into agriculture and they went out into the bush. And he says, only the biggest and the strongest survived. And he says, as a result, the gene pool, on average, is so many kgs greater than the average European. Mm. And that's, and he says, over the next 10 years, rugby is going to become a game of attrition. And that's where we're going to have advantages. Yeah. Because of the sheer mass of these guys. And he, all right, he was, it became a game of attrition. And the exploitation of space, take the center has the, has, has the rugby ball. There is an opportunity maybe for a split second to cut through the opposing defense. But that was about the, and we developed a support play. And, the, you know, from Gaelic football, we tried it out with them. And they thought it was very interesting the whole idea of support play and going for the gap, mm. you know, and that part of it evolved as well as the aerial skills. And the interesting thing was they did win the All-Ireland, or the, <laughs> All <-Ireland, this> <laughs> the World Cup yeah. the following year. Mickey Ned, the, so. the time Mickey Ned led the Springboks for a World Cup final and <laughs> a World Cup win. Uh, but just, and that was say you were speaking about, obviously, all that they took from our game. But just from a manager over there, is there anything that you really came back with that you took away uh, as a manager that you came back with, kind of that you could bring back to the GA or that you kind of shaped your own management? Well, I suppose they were professionals. Mm. And down to the very branding, what amazed me in the Blue Bulls, even the branding in the tiles inside, in, in the, where they went for a shower, after the training session, you had a blue bull in every, every tile around, and if the, the branding was everywhere, it was a kind of a, a brainwashing of a brand, of a culture, and they all bought into this, and it became their whole life. It, 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 they lived, ate, and slept this, this this culture mm. but the, the other thing was they were willing to, to to learn from other sports they were looking outside the, the the parameters are the frontiers of south africa and they were looking can we get learn from other they never stopped evolving or progressing and the other thing i, I learned was the way they coached the team at the time. And it hadn't come in here at the time was decision making. That what they did, they did not tell the players what to do. They created situations in the coaching environment where they had to work it out for themselves. And they discussed it afterwards. But they would not they just created environments in coaching where decision making would take place and they would learn from continuously being placed in these different environments 
and different coaching situations continuously to develop instant decision making. That's what I found amazing. And it's it's it reminded me I was at Aristotle. No, no, Socrates. He was he existed two thousand years ago. He says, Tell me and I will forget. Show me, I will remember, but involve me and I will understand. So they really involved all their players in the decision-making process. They created the environment in the coaching where they had to decide for themselves in that, in the pressurized environment. And that was something I took from it. And it has obviously moved into Gaelic games since. You speak, you speak about that coaching there, um, Mickey, and uh, I know you've spoke earlier about um, the likes of Donny Buckley and Keane O'Neill and coaches you've had within different setups you've been involved in. Um, just in, to touch on Donny Buckley for a second, and I know he was involved with Mayo and the, the defending he was doing, and we'd say the work of the, the art of defending and, and, and getting the tackling right. It's a huge part of Gaelic football. Um, is it something that we'd say is focused on an awful lot in terms of coaching uh, within the game? And is it, um, we'd say when we talk about tactics in Gaelic football, is is that art of defending a huge part of it? Yes. it's And what Noni was very good at was the technical side of defending. Getting it right without falling, but that the corner forward had to defend. He was the your first line of defense. The minute possession was lost, he had to defend above corner forward. And technically, individually, he was very good on the technical side. But together, as a team, he, he was very good at, at coaching teams to defend as a unit. And when to defend, when you lose possession, and then how to attack instantaneously once possession was won, and the movement of quick movement of the ball. Donny was, was uh, and to defend without fouling. Donny was, he, he, he was exceptional. He's, a, he's an engineer by profession, and he brought this, engineering side which i hadn't seen before then to gaelic games and but he was careful that it didn't become a technical exercise it became spontaneous as a result of continuous repetition and players in it became ingrained in their whole makeup after a while it sounds very technical at the beginning but it, it, it evolves and it becomes second nature into the, the whole psychic. And uh, I think even last year now, he once he got on board last year with Kerry, I think he transformed the defense, which was very porous, into a very, very solid uh, defense by the end of the season. And I thought he was exceptional. And uh, he was a big asset, and he brought my thinking of, of all about coaching to a new level as well. Mm. Yeah, defending defending is a very it's a very hard skill to to teach and teach a technique, yes. that, uh, particularly in hurling and Gaelic football. Um, but like it's it's one thing that definitely Johnny Buckley has in his forte that that he has definitely transformed Kerry, and even when he was with Mayo. Yeah. Mayo's and it's, it, a big thing was his repetition. An interesting aside here was, I suppose it was 2013 or sometime that anyway, I was appointed manager of the Kerry Minor team. And I brought John O'Keefe as, as in with me as physical trainer. But John o has a great knowledge of team preparation and he's striving all the time for perfection. and. We decided anyway, we'd send Jano over to Manchester United to Sir Alex to, 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 sh to, to shadow him for a couple of days. 
So there was a good friend of ours, a priest, the parish priest of Old Trafford anyway, arranged it. So Jana went over and spent a couple of days shadowing Sir Alex. And um, so the one thing Jono got from him was co coaching is all about repetition. That was his mantra, repetition, repetition. But, um, and also they went to see an under eight game. And Jono says, how, how, how how do you think you will know whether these eight-year-olds will play for Manchester United? And he said, by the amount of aggression that they demonstrate, we'll have a good idea. So it'll be an interesting comment. But that goes back to um, repetition of what I, I, I would go further. It's repetition of situations of decision-making situations okay. that you build up the repertoire of decision making in in your mindset and, and if I can at high intensity at high intensity i finally just just to bring you back there uh, do, uh we'd say on uh i suppose when, when you spoke about minors there and you were involved in 2013 and uh we'd say you were involved in development squads and and we'd say implementing the the new template in in, in within Kerry GA. But one thing you said at the start of the interview was minors and if they win at minor level, they lose the bit of hunger going forward. Uh, one thing was very noticeable is that in in the nineties, Kerry were in seven under twenty one All Ireland finals, and they saw huge benefits of that going into senior in being in the next 10 years of 2000 to 2010, they were in eight senior finals. But, um, yes, but how many minors were they in? They were in one in 20 years. They won one minor in 20 years. That's what I was going to say, exactly. Yes. And I think that the under 21 level is a great indicator. Well, it is under 20 now, but I still under 21. The maturity, you see, what happens is they go to third level and the, it takes them a while to settle into the freedom of third level, the enjoyment, the social in, the social life. And a lot of players lose, lose the focus at that stage. The hunger goes, lots of the bright lights look more attractive. But by the time they get through that, and once they get to under 21 level, they will have stabilized. Yeah. And from there on, then the indicator was the minor, and it's even less now when it is under 17, then it's even more difficult to bring them on, I think. Yeah. Coming into a, a setup like that, Mickey, we'll say where you're trying to develop 17 year olds and stuff. I know you've spoken a lot about it being kind of more of a, a journey, I suppose is your big phrase rather than a destination. But what, what are your main focuses then coming into a, a setup like that with minors, you know, in terms of how you're going to bring them on and develop them? What are your, your main aspects that you're focusing on? I suppose it is, is, is um, I suppose, mindset and attitude. Attitude is, is so important. And that, that as you say yourself, uh, like it's a journey it's a process and it's about getting the right attitude the right commitment to and the right uh, i suppose towards self-improvement that there is no stopping you will never reach this goal i don't know if you saw michael jordan recently in that series mm -hmm. This is continuous search for self-improvement, that there was no limit to what you can improve. And that hunger must remain, that it's always self-improvement, getting better, working on the, every aspect of your game, and you will never, ever perfect it. But it's a process in a journey towards perfection, and that it's every session you have to improve some part of your game there's an objective going into every session or if, if there's a gym session if there's a, a skill session if there's a coaching session no matter what it is it is also 
value added. You're trying to put added value to your repertoire at all times. And that's the only way. If you have seven or eight, the, 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 the one example I can get from inter-county football was Jack O'Shea. Jack O'Shea never stopped pushing himself. And I remember when I took over Kerry, he was um, he was in the end of his career, but he decided he'd stay on. So we didn't pick him. So he started from scratch again. And he did, uh, I think, seven mile island medals. And he started working, working. He got back on the team. He encouraged every young player around him. He kept improving all the time. Till his very last game, he always pushed himself to the very limit. And he'd be, to me, that Michael Jordan of Gaelic football, you know? <clears throat> Brilliant. Uh, Excellent. Excellent. I suppose, Mickey, just before we finish up, anyway, we've seen you we'll say, on the pitch and we've seen you on the sideline. Um, but stepping away from GA, how, how do you step away from it all? I, I know now that you're retired, you've kind of had a chance to, to take a break, but... I, I I have no problem because I have a lot of interests. I'm involved in a lot of local community things, uh, associations, and and uh, outside of sport. I, mean, I like cycling. I like running. I like, as you know, kayaking. <laughs> I like um, lots of different uh, things that keep me energized. And gardening would probably be my number one passion. Super. Very good. But well, lastly, I suppose, Mickey, if you're open to it, just before we finish, uh, if we could yeah. do a, a kind of a rapid, quick fire question round where we'll just put 10 questions to you. I'll put you on the timer uh, and right. we'll do 10 kind of rapid fire questions. So you're going three, right. two, one. Your favorite footballer? Jack O'Shea. Your favorite soccer team? Uh, Manchester United. Oh, uh-huh. your favorite song? Baisa Barna Shrada. Oh, uh-huh. <laughs> rugby or soccer? Rugby. Uh, your favourite stadium? Uh, Crook Park. The last book you read? Uh, Ego is the Enemy. Oh. Uh, one sporting event you'd like to go to? Uh, Super Bowl. And an All Ireland 2020 football, if we saw one, who's, who's going to win it? Kerry. And your favourite podcast? <laughs> the Extended Panel. No, so. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, well, that just about uh, concludes all the time we have. Mickey, thanks a million for coming on the show and sharing your yeah, pleasure, your insights and stories. Phenomenal. Uh, you've been a fantastic servant to, to Kerry and to Limerick and given us some amazing memories. So thanks a million for coming on and uh, we'll keep in touch. Thanks, Mickey. Thanks, Ty. Pleasure. Uh, well, folks, that just about concludes today's episode. Uh, we're out of time. Thanks a million again to Mickey Ned O'Sullivan for a great interview and a fantastic chat for sharing his thoughts and his insights. I'm sure you enjoyed it as much as we here at the Extended Panel did. If you'd like to get in contact with the page, as always, feel free to do so on Instagram or Twitter at Extended Panel uh, or contact us at info at learmedia.tv. Uh, if you're listening on YouTube or if you're listening on Spotify, make sure to like and subscribe uh, or to follow the page. Thanks a million and we'll see you all next week with a brand new episode of the Extended Panel. Oh, 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 oh